It is important, um, first of all, for me to pay homage once again to the victims and the survivors of the what is clearly um, the worst, worst example of man's inhumanity to man um, 30 years after the fact. But the sad reality of conflict is that sometimes they're conducted on the bodies of women. Mm. And women, sadly, are used as a tool of war. And it's, it's, it's a theme that resonates throughout conflict. Mm. I think it's so important for victims and survivors of widespread attacks, and violations of international law, to be able to follow the accountability process. Hello there. My guest this week on the Long Form Podcast is Dr. Charles Adegun Phillips, a former prosecutor at the Arusha-based ICTR court. As a prosecutor at the Arusha-based ICTR court, he won 12 out of 13 cases securing convictions. Hello there. Before we dive into today's conversation, have you subscribed to our channel yet? If you haven't, do so. And remember to share your thoughts with us in the comments below and like this video. Your support means a lot. Now let's get into it. Dr. Charles Adiagun Phillips, welcome to The Long Farm. Thank you for having me. Um, so you're here for Quibuka 30. I am, yes. Why is it so important for you to be here physically? Um, it is important, um, first of all, for me to pay homage once again to the victims and the survivors of the, what is clearly um, the worst, worst example of man's inhumanity to man um, 30 years after the fact. Um, I often have to pinch myself to realize that so much time has, has gone by um, from 26 years ago when I was first involved in this subject matter, having arrived in Kigali on the 5th of January to, uh, 1998 mm. from London mm. to join the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda as a legal officer at first and later as a prosecutor and going on to be lead prosecutor. Yeah. And in that process, I interacted with myriads and hundreds of victims and witnesses of the worst crime known to mm. mankind. Um, to have the opportunity to return um, to this country 14 years after I, I left the UN and stopped prosecuting genocide. Um, and to, to be able to pay tribute once again mm. um, to the many lives lost and to the survivors yeah. of that crime, of those crimes. Yes. So you joined the office of the prosecutor yes uh, at 32 years of age i was just turning 32 yes. I, I turned That's... 32 three months after i joined yes. yes you're quite young i was very young what drove you to seek that position first of all opportunity mm. um the way the opportunity was crouched at the beginning was the opportunity of a un job mm. i'd always dreamt of an international job I'd always wanted to be a diplomat. Um, I don't think I quite realized at the time that there was a difference between the international civil service mm -hmm. and diplomacy, yes. as it were. But um, just the initial thought of, of being involved in the UN and uh, practicing law within the United Nations. But of course, very quickly after I arrived, it occurred to me that I was actually involved in something that was unique unique both in terms of the tragedy, unique both in terms of the occurrence, but unique in terms of the fact that there was no precedent yeah. to what uh, we were doing. I, 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 because when I, I saw that you had joined at that age, uh, I, I immediately asked myself, was it just another job for you? Or had there been like some kind of drive that you had to you know, prosecute genocide? Interestingly enough, mm. I had no prior experience of prosecuting anything, mm. be it genocide or theft or anything. On the contrary, I, my background was criminal defense. Mm. I was a practicing criminal defense lawyer in London. Yes. And contrary to 
prosecution. I was actually defending criminals. Mm. Um, so both the prospect of being involved in the prosecution or even in the legal advisory aspect of the work was uncharted territory. Mm. It was all new. Um, the subject matter, however, um, was what caught my attention. Because mm. prior to that, sitting in my living room in, in, in London, been watching videos of um, this whole tragedy mm. um, occurring um, in Rwanda and in the former Yugoslavia, like mm. a year before. Mm. Um, the Iraq, the invasion of Iraq had happened a few years before and there'd just been this series of uh, calamitous international events just unfolding all over the world. Um, so when the opportunity came, um, like I said, the first thing that occurred to me is it's a chance to work with the United Nations. Mm. The second thing is it's a legal position. So you're, going, you're not going to work in the UN as a diplomat or a civil servant. You're going to work as a lawyer. And then the subject matter. At the time, it didn't occur to me that there was no precedent in what we're, what we're about to do or what mm. we're about to embark on. That, that hit me shortly after I arrived um, at the tribunal. And I realized that every, every, everything we did was groundbreaking. Mm. Um, most of the employees at the time were actually seconded from their countries mm. um, in various capacities, security, investigation. Um, we hadn't started the prosecution at the time. We were investigating and building the cases and drafting the indictments. So mm. it was more kind of academic, um, going into the field, assessing the witness statements that were being gathered, um, and trying to decipher what crimes marry with the allegations in those indictments. Mm. And then at a later stage, we started going into the field um, to actually meet with the witnesses, to see the massacre sites, and in some cases, to um, excavate mass graves. Yes. And that was very difficult. I can imagine. So you fly from London. Yes. Get on, to on, on, on Sabina Airways, I'll yeah, never forget, yes, from yes. Brussels. <laughs> yeah, so it was Brussels, Kigali, Kigali, Arusha? Correct. No, it was, it was London, Brussels, Brussels, Kigali. Mm. And then I remained in Rwanda for okay. about nine months mm. or ten months before Arusha. So I, I just want you to go back in, mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. It... it how well oiled was that machine? Was that UN machine at that moment? Um, you know, was everything smooth sailing? Or were you just trying to figure things out on the fly? Young lawyer, new country, terrible events. How do you navigate all those things? Well, let's start from the UN presence. You, you, we all will recall that there was some element of UN presence already in Rwanda and in Kigali, even in Amahoro Stadium, mm. Mm. which is where we were located. Mm. There was the UNIMER Yes, the UNIMER, force. yes. Um, but of course, when the ICTR started and when the ICTR was formed in 19, 1994, later in 95, when actually the operation started using the, the framework, the infrastructural framework of the UNIMER, which had then been dismantled. Um, we very quickly had to realize that the, the mandate of the U UNIMER and the operations of UNIMER was detrimentally different um, to what we were about to embark on. Um, they were a peacekeeping force. We were essentially a criminal investigation office. Mm. Um, we, 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 we inherited the infrastructure of UNIMER, mm. you know, the telephone system, the office, the furniture. Some the cars, of the, the car, some of the cars, mm. um, all beat up, um, all beat up cars in terrible states, um, and some of the personnel, the communication personnel, the security personnel, and some of the administrative staff. Beyond that, um, a lot of the investigation staff were loaned from countries because it, it, the UN employment or recruitment machinery takes a while. Mm. Um, because at the time, everything was being done through New York. Yes. Um, so it, it's the, the wheels of the administrative recruitment machinery turned very slowly. Mm. In the interim, many governments had loaned personnel 
to the uh, ICTR, yeah. um, both in terms of uh, the, especially the investigation. So the first crop of investigations that joined the tribunal were from Denmark and the Norwegian yeah. countries and the British government as well, Scottish investigators, and also investigators from the African continent. I had many Malian colleagues, Senegalese yeah. colleagues and all that. So they were the, they were the initial um, um, staff members that, that, that first came in and their mandate basically um, was to determine persons who bore the greatest responsibility for the oh. genocide. Because of course, um, our mandate was derived from the preamble of the resolution that created the tribunal. Oh to prosecute and investigate persons who bear the greatest responsibility for the um, international uh, violations of international law in the yeah. territory of Rwanda and yeah. in neighboring territories. Yeah. So that already presupposes that as an institution, we were not after the foot soldiers, yeah. we were after the ringleaders. Yeah. But then how do you determine who That's those, who, who those ringleaders were? Yeah. Um, but we had the benefit of the report of the uh, Human Rights Special Rapporteur, Desengi, who had been in this country and had done a lot of um, investigation prior to the advent of the, of, the, of the tribunal. And we had historical ex experts like uh, Alison DeForge, mm. Philip Rangens, and so many, even local Rwandans who had documented a lot of what had gone on. Um, and very quickly, we were faced with the option prosecutorially as to whether or not to try and mirror what had taken place in Nuremberg oh. or to try and um, customize or device our own approach. Of course, the, the, the Nuremberg um, uh, example had a military flavor. And where, the Nuremberg, for those who don't know, were the trials that were held uh, at the end of the Second World Second War. Second World War. Yes, to yes, prosecute the to Nazis. To prosecute the Nazis. Mm. And the, the major difference with Nuremberg and obviously Rwanda, first of all, was the scale of the atrocities. Secondly, there were many more assailants involved in the Rwandan scenario than there were in the, in the Nuremberg scenario. Yeah. And the third was that the Nuremberg was basically all designed around the military and the whole process of accountability had a military kind of flavor to it. So yeah. it was a lot easier to, to, to have 29 or to have so many um, defendants in one room in a, in a, in a, in a military court martial sort of environment, as opposed to the ICTR, which in terms of its structure was very adversarial in nature. And um, this will lead to another topic as to where we go from here and the future of international law as to whether or not, with the benefit of hindsight, the inquisitorial system of justice, criminal justice, which is the French system, mm. may be better suited to the investigation and prosecution of international crimes as opposed to the adversarial system, which is the common law system, mm. uh, which is the model, of course, we had in the ICTR. The ICTR system was very adversarial in nature, very mm. common law mm. influenced. Mm. Um, and we very quickly realized that the Nuremberg um, structure or model would, was clearly not suited for our scenario um, in the tribunal. Um, but going back to making those choices as to who bore the greatest responsibility for the genocide, well, the very nature of a genocide presupposes the sanction on the part of state. Mm. Um, if, you, if you examine the dolus specialis, which is the special intention for the crime of genocide, which is, which is, only, is, which is unique to that crime, there's no other crime, and that, that's what distinguishes genocide from any other international crime, is that the, the prosecutor has to demonstrate that there was a specific intent to destroy, in whole or in part, mm. members of a group, mm. targeted as such, mm. in whole or in part, either on racial, religious, or political grounds. Mm. That would presuppose that there cannot be a genocide without the active involvement of states. Of course. So very clearly, at least we knew that the political brass 
the military brass and the um, leadership had to be targets. But what we didn't know and we didn't envisage was that the target group would extend to religious and the clergy. Mm. It very then quickly occurred to us as we went from massacre sites to massacre sites that there were many more Tutsis killed inside churches mm. than anywhere else in Rwanda. Mm. Shockingly. And there was a consistent pattern of conduct, be it Presbyterian, be it Seventh-day Adventist, be it um, Anglican. Uh, Anglican Church of England, be it Catholic. Yes. There was a common theme that resonated throughout Rwanda because churches were seen as preconceived safe havens in times of prior violence and squirmishes in the country. But what was different on this occasion was that the perpetrators had actively encouraged people to gather at those locations, mm. knowing full well that they were vulnerable. Mm. And they did so with the active complicity of the clergy. And sometimes participation. Oh, yes. Mm. I can tell you that <laughs> in my sleep. Mm. But so once we realized that there was a current theme that ran across Rwanda, from pref in those days they called them prefectures, from prefecture to prefecture, from cellu to cellu, from commune to commune, what is it about these churches? It very quickly occurred to us that, oh, these are preconceived safe havens. And then the witness testimony began to unravel how victims had been lured, purposefully lured, into these churches and locations until the, they were full and the perpetrators and the, and the military brass were asked to surround the churches and people could no longer exit the churches. And there was a sequential, um, almost like a timetable within certain prefectures to attack certain locations. We'll do this on this day. And once that church was attacked on this day, news would filter to these people, oh, you are next, mm. and you are next, and you are next. And that is what gave rise to Philip, the title of Philip Gorovich's book, the American author who wrote the book, we wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. Mm. That title emanated from a letter which was written by the refugees and the victims in Mugunero to a man called Pastor Elisafan in mm. Takitu Romana, mm. who was the head of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. When the victims and members of his congregation who were gathered at the Mugunero Parish Church had gotten wind from the gendarmerie mm. that was surrounding the church that the Mubuga church had been attacked down the road in Gishita. And they were next. They then scribbled the leadership um, of those refugees, then scribbled a note off to the pastor and handed it over to one of the gendarmes and said, can you please go and give this to our spiritual head and tell him, this is still trusting mm. that he'll do something. He will do something. And they scribbled this note to him saying, Please help us. They've just informed us that our date is going to come tomorrow. Lo and behold, much to their surprise, the response was very lukewarm. There is probably nothing that he did to protect them. He had then handed this letter over to this American journalist who was investigating the whole Muganero attack in the U.S., and then Pastor Antakus Romana was with his son in Laredo, Texas, just on the border of Mexico. He had fled from Rwanda. And many Rwandans in the U.S. had heard of his presence in America yeah. and brought it to the attention of the American authorities that this is not a good man. 
He mm. did this, he did this and this. And this whole interest um, came to light as to what he'd been involved in. At the time, his son Gerard, Dr. Gerard, had already been arrested in Ivory Coast. Mm. And he was already in the custody of the tribunal. But the pastor was still at large in the US and had been able to retain, I don't know whether he retained it himself or it was retained for him by the Seventh-day Adventist uh, movement, the most high-profile defense lawyer in America, a man called Ramsey Clark, yes. who used to be the Attorney General of the US under mm. Lyndon Johnson. I guess it kind of is just further proof of just how some of these religious organizations, even at their very highest level, Correct. Uh, were protecting killers. Um, whether purposefully or inadvertently, that was the practical mm. result, Yeah, sadly. And this work that you, you, you and your team were doing, you know, like you said, grave site to grave site, mm -hmm. mass grave to mass grave, mm -hmm. church to church, it seemed like a lot of work. Yes. It must have been a lot of work. It was. How big was this team? Huh. Um, first of all, um, the complexity of it was that we had a, the genocide, as you know, was nationwide. Mm. So, in terms of our work, the office had to be divided along geographical um, locations where the mass, uh, the, the most um, sustained attacks took place. Mm. And also thematic groups. So for example, let me give you an example of a thematic group. So we had geographical groups like Kibuye, mm. which is called Karongi now. Um, Kibuye was significant in, the, in, two, in two, two regards. The first regard, some of the earliest attacks took place in Kibuye. Mm. Kibuye was a very strong Tutsi uh, enclave, but it was also the location for some of the most sustained attacks. So whilst attacks had taken place in the first week in April, mm. in most places in Rwanda, Attacks were still taking place in, in Bicicero until June. Mm. Because Kibuye had a lot of hills. So a lot of the attacks that took place in the Kibuye town, a lot of the survivors had fled up onto the hills of Bicicero. And they were able to um, repel attacks mm. for weeks and weeks and weeks because they had the benefit of the elevation. Mm, the higher ground. Higher ground to see when the attackers were approaching. Mm, yeah. And they would throw rockets at them and they would resist them. So it mm. took a long time for the refugees in, in, uh, in Bicicero to be conquered. And that went on for months. So it was very obvious from the initial investigation that Kibuye as a geographical location had to be um, dealt with as a geographical theme. Then we had areas like Chiangugo as well. Then we had the intellectuals in Butari. Mm. So we had all these investigative teams divided around the strong um, uh, points of casualties. Mm. But we also had other thematic groups that revolved around the leadership, obviously, um, the political leadership the um, military leadership mm. and very quickly we realized like i said the involvement of the clergy but the decision was now do we deal with the clergy as a thematic group or do we deal with the clergy as based on the geographical location of where these attacks took place. And the decision was taken that it's actually better just to deal with the geographical location. So when, if we were looking into the Bugusera region, we look at the Interama church, the Yamata church. And if we're looking at Kibuye, we're looking at Home Saint Jean. And we're looking, if we're looking at Kigali, we're looking at uh, uh, San Famil in, in Kigali and, and in all those locations. So once we divided the teams and uh, set up the teams, we then had to populate the teams with um, 
investigators. Mm -hmm. The investigators reported to us lawyers. So um, the, we had two scenarios. We could have lawyers embedded in the investigation team, but we also had a crop of lawyers who gave guidance um, when the investigators came back with witness statements. And the guidance was, was as follows. The, invest, the investigators didn't have the experience of investigating international crimes. Mm. What does that mean? It means that they didn't necessarily know what to look for, the elements that we as prosecutors mm. were required to prove. Mm. Um, so if you're taking a, a witness statement of an atrocities, an atrocity, and somebody is complaining about or is giving evidence or giving information about something, there were key questions that you needed to ask um, in terms of identity, in terms of location. So how far were you from him? Mm. How did you know he was the prefect? Had you seen him before? Mm. You talk about him being in a blue Pajero. How do you know the color blue? How do you know it was a Pajero? Mm. Um, you, you know, how many times had you seen him before? But more importantly, there were questions that were unique to the kind of work we were doing. We needed to identify the victim as belonging to the Tutsi ethnic group. So it's important for you to say, how did you know that um, Imakule was Tutsi? Oh, I've known Imakule for, you know, we lived in the same neighborhood, she was Tutsi, blah, blah, blah. Because you see, we needed for the witness statement to indicate that those being sought were being sought because of their ethnicity. Mm. So you just don't go into the field and take me and obtain a witness statement that does not actually indicate mm. that the person being sought mm. has been identified or was, was, being, was capable of being identified as belonging to a particular ethnic group. Mm. There was a case, for example, with the Mika Muimana investigation and trial where Mika was alleged to have raped somebody. He didn't realize that. Well, he raped her thinking she was Tutsi. And then after he finished, he realized, oh, he made a mistake. And somebody said, oh, actually, she's Hutu. And so she went and apologized to her. Said, yeah. You know what? I'm so sorry. Yeah. I didn't realize you were Hutu. That indicates to you the need for our investigators to be able to obtain those statements in a particular way yeah. that will be useful to us as prosecutors to be able to build our case. Yeah. And they needed to be educated on those elements. Um, the widespread and systematic nature of attacks. Your witness statement had to be able to indicate that these were not sporadic attacks. These were plans. These were widespread. It was taking place in Kajongi Hill. It was also taking place in Muira Hill. It was also taking place in Bisicero. There were meetings and people were planning. And because there was no precedent for what we did, in the early days, our job was to look through those witness statements to make sure that the various elements of the crimes that we wanted to charge the accused persons with were contained therein. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial assignment of mapping out the scope and the area of the investigation to decide which international crimes had been violated and we wanted to investigate, of course, everybody, genocide, well, we, we all know genocide, murder, extermination, they all have different elements. And then there was the challenge of whether or not we were going to be able to investigate gender-specific crimes. Mm. And why is this important? Well, um, right? But the sad reality of conflict is that sometimes they're conducted on the bodies of women. Mm. And women, sadly, are used as a tool of war. And it's, mm. it's, it's a theme that resonates throughout conflict mm. internationally. And we couldn't turn our, our eye to that because there was evidence of sexual violence and rape against Tutsi women. Mm. And the, the um, motive was clear. If the Tutsi were being targeted for complete destruction and elimination as, a, as an ethnic group, the, the average Hutu man was encouraged that look, this is your last opportunity mm. to sample what 
it will be like to be with a Tutsi woman. You know why? Because we're going to kill all of them. Mm. And those of you who've never had the opportunity to date a Tutsi girl or a Tutsi woman or to even marry one, this is your chance. Because if you don't have it now, you would never find a Tutsi on, on the surface of this planet. So go out and sample what Tutsi women are like. That was the motive. Who was saying that? Oof, propaganda. Mm. It was widespread propaganda. Mm. And it was, it, it was what it was repeated by witness after witness. It was often said the attackers, the leadership, were encouraging the low-ranking um, attackers, basically saying, look, Tutsi women were revered in society. Right? For you to have the opportunity to be with a Tutsi man or woman, you have to be established. So you low-ranking attackers who would never have had the opportunity, never in your life would dream of being with a Tutsi woman. This is your opportunity to see what they're like before we kill all of them. Huh. And that was what was at the back of the average attacker's mind. Yeah when they were being actively encouraged by the leadership, not only to kill, but before you kill them, you need to sample them. And that's what they told you? Absolutely. That's what our witnesses told us. Mm. Not only did they tell us that, it was evident from some of the corpses that we found that that was what was being done. What logical sense would it make for Tutsi women or a Tutsi woman to be serially raped. And after she's been serially raped by 10 soldiers, they then stick spears in her private power. What logical sense would it make for a Tutsi woman who is obviously pregnant to be killed and her stomach be sliced open so that they can see what the fetus of a Tutsi looks like? The whole idea mm. was to eliminate the race. Complete elimination. Yeah. And when we talk about genocidal intent, genocidal intent has to be inferred from conduct. It's inferred from propaganda. It's inferred from hate speech. It's inferred from labeling people who belong to a certain race as cockroaches and insects and all sorts of things. It's inferred from conduct, specific targeting of people and women based on gender. It's, it's inferred from steps taken to prevent the reproduction of members of that group. Mm. When you start attacking neonatal clinics, when you start disemboweling women who are pregnant, what are you doing? You're basically saying, we need to stop them from reprodu mm. reproducing. Mm. And this is, you're, you're going through all of this. Yes. I asked your question, how big was the team? There were different teams. So are you talking about hundreds of people? Um, Thousands? No, not initially. Um, because you see, <laughs> the work was done in stages. Um, and I remember when I was recruited, we had a, we had a humongous, the, the tribunal had then been going on for maybe about two, two years or 18 months. And we had a, a staffing crisis. Um, because it was just very difficult to attract people to come and work in Rwanda. Mm. So we had teams made up of staff that had been loaned to us by various countries. But that was fixed in time. It wasn't open-ended. You can only loan staff to the UN for a year or two. Mm. Um, a lot of those countries were not willing for those staff to just be loaned. So at some stage the UN had to start recruiting their own staff. Now, it happened in two ways. Some of the staff who had been loaned would then resign from their countries mm. and then join the UN mm. so that there was continuity. Because, of course, we didn't want to lose the institutional knowledge yes. that we had gained from a lot of these volunteers. Mm. Well, not volunteers, they were paid, but mm. they were loaned to us. So a lot of the initial staff were loaned. They then resigned, joined the UN as, as the members. Um, and the teams would grow. So initially, maybe from initial 100, 
100 staff mm -hmm. um, to 200 to 300. I think by the time I got in, we were probably about 300 staff in mm -hmm. Kigali. 300 staff yes. to, to versus, versus a genocide of over a million people. Yes, and involve, involving, involving at least 200,000 perpetrators. Yes, must have been quite a... I, I, you, 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 just, you said uh, earlier that when you were deciding to kind of figure out how you shall break down yes. how you investigate yes. and, and how you break down... So there were politicians, the politics, yes. there was geographical location, Yes. And, but you also said that you then decided not to almost create a separate uh, religious... The, the, thematic group. The, thematic group. For the clergy. Was it because you were afraid of the Catholic Church? No, mm -hmm. we were not afraid of the Catholic Church. At the time, we didn't even know that the Catholic Church was that implicated in the genocide. Mm. Um, that was not the, the, the rationale. The rationale was really that the churches were located in various geographical locations spread around the country. Um, that's the first point. The second point was that the churches were already preconceived locations of safety in previous conflicts that people would run to. So again, there was nothing terribly unique about that. And again, it was happening all over the country. Now, the third thing was that there was a re reoccurring theme in all the regions in Rwanda about the um, influence and the en encouragement of religious leaders to encourage their parishioners and members of their congregation to seek refuge at those locations. Again, another reoccurring theme throughout the country. The same modus operandi. Come, come with your family, come with your personal effects. You would have food. There's food here, there's water here, we'll look after you, blah, blah, blah. That thing, as we continue the investigation, was reoccurring over and over again throughout the country. It was not unique to any religious group, Catholic or otherwise. Mm. It was happening all over the country. And it was happening in different locations. So in order to tell the story based on the way the attacks took place, it was more efficient to deal with it based on geographical locations, saying we're looking at Mubuga Church, we're looking at Home Saint Jean, all this in Kibuye. Mm. Um, before the survivors, whoever survived at those locations or who never went there, then fled onto the hills of Bissesero. Mm. Um, as it happened in Mubuga, it was happening at Untarama Church. As it happened at Ntarama Church, it was happening at Yamata Church in Bugesera. Mm. As it happened at those locations, it was happening in churches in Butari. It was also happening at San Fami in, uh, in Kigali. So there was, it wasn't an orchestrated plan based on the Catholic Church or the Presbyterian Church or the Seventh-day Adventists. It was just part of a national plan to gather people at preconceived safe locations, mm. be they hospitals or churches. But in reality, they were churches. Yeah. Don't ask me why no one was gathered in the mosque. Because we, we, that's a question for another day. Yeah, I, I'd like to ask you. So, you decided that you know we will try to figure out and 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 eventually prosecute the leaders, the leaders, yes, um, who made genocide possible. They bore the ultimate, the greatest responsibility yes. for the genocide. Yes. What I want to know is how did you choose at to what level of leadership? Yes. 
uh, because at the time, yes. obviously, there was national leaders. National leaders. There were the military leaders. Yes. There were the local administration. Yes. And because of the way our society uh, was formed and, yes. and how it managed itself, it was a very stratified, very stratified, correct, kind of. So, mm -hmm. why did you, for example, maybe why not go for, you know, every level of leadership? Why stop at say the burgomaster? Uh, did you why not go even lower than that? Because it very quickly occurred to us that. So, so before maybe uh, so maybe you can say you can help us understand okay who were the leaders that you prosecuted and then why did you prosecute okay them? so we, we we had we had um, like I said we had this whole idea of prosecuting um, of having an indictment that reflected the totality of the political leadership mm. so the members of the MRND. Um, which was the, the political party in place, mm. the government ministers, the, from the prime minister, the entire cabinet, mm. um, the political leadership, then the military brass, Bagasura and all his cohorts, and mm. uh, General, General Indy Lemana, and the, you know, the, the military brass, the head of the gendarmerie, and the head of the... And then uh, we then had some very powerful um, political leaders who may not have held de facto positions, uh, sorry, who may not have held the uh, de jure positions, but they had um, quite a substantial influence either in terms of financing the party or in terms of the political leadership and then the media. Because you see, um, the way the hate speech and the propaganda against the Tutsi spread was through the media, Kangura Press, uh, Radio RTLM yeah. and uh, Hassan Ngeze and uh, Mr. Ruggio and the lot. That was the, the outline of this whole crime. And the idea behind that global, we called it the global indictment. That was the internal term we used for it. We yeah. called it the global indictment. The idea behind the global indictment in the early days was this. There was one genocide. Just one. Hmm. The genocide in Rwanda was a single crime. And we wanted to reflect it as a single crime. Hmm. Rather than this notion that there were several genocides. No, there was only one genocide. There was one plan. It was nationwide. There was one perpetration nationwide. It was taking place at the same time, nationwide. So there was, it was only one genocide, one crime. So that informed the decision to have the political brass, the leadership, and the administrative brass lumped in one indictment. And then we were going to do it, the same thing, across regions. So in Kibuye, for example, we were going to take eight people. Prefect Kayeshima, Obed Rosindana, the businessman. Uh, we were going to look at Mwika Muyimana, who was a concierge. We were going to look at Ignis Baklishima, who was a Vogmast. Trying to reflect the local, the political structure at the local level. Mm. From commune level to sectorial level but then have the global indictment which dealt with the national structure. And we were going to run with those templates at the same time. Would you like to partner with us here at the Long Form? If you do, you can send an email to us at longformronda at gmail.com. Partner with us and become part of Rwanda's most exciting and in-depth podcast. It's really interesting that you talk about one genocide yes. that happened. Yes, that was the, the theory. So, <clears throat> what makes it? What I, I, I take from that is that it's almost a pushback because what we're now facing, uh, thirty years since mm -hmm. 1994, is genocide uh, denial, as well as uh, a, a 
a horrible theory of double genocide. Mm. Yes, reprisals. Um, what are your thoughts on that? No, oh, well, um, yeah. I, I, I had the, of, of all the prosecutors at the ICTR, I had the benefits of not only prosecuting the genocide against the Tutsi, but I had the benefit of spending 18 months as head of investigation, special investigations, right, into the alleged theory of the double genocide against the Hutu. There were not many of us that were privileged to have both insight. Mm. So after I had prosecuted seven or eight cases, fatigue set in, and I was thinking of leaving the tribunal. My children were becoming about time to go to secondary school. I'd been in the office for eight years, ten years, about ten years. And the prosecutor said to me, no, don't go. Um, I want you to help me with something. Do something different. Do something different. Stop going to court. You've done all this court for a while. Take a break. Let me give you something else to do. I want you to head special investigations. Now, the special investigation unit was a covert investigation unit. Mm -hmm. There were very few people who had insight to what happened there. Because, of course, for obvious reasons, um, it was the unit that was looking at what the other side allegedly did. So, to cut a story, long story short, I had 18 months of doing that. And that gave me an insight into this theory, what's involved in this theory of a double genocide. Did the Tutsis have controlled Rwanda in June? really go after the Hutus and chase them into the refugee camps? The answer is no. Having said that, there was clear evidence that there were some reprisal attacks. Um, there's no evidence from where I was sitting that those reprisal attacks were coordinated or state-sponsored. Right? You cannot avoid soldiers in a battalion who have come back from the war front and found members of their family slain and then just losing it and just going after it. You, 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 even, even with the best efforts, you can't prevent. Did I find any structured, concerted effort on the part of the Rwandan state? post June or July 1994 to target Hutus in the refugee camps or in various parts of Rwanda, no. And, and how about the, the idea? Because this is some of the discussions that, I, that absolutely frustrate me. Right. Is, you know, on one side, there was the entire Hamwe with the, the XFAR yes. and the... The state. The state, yes. And right. the state apparatus mm -hmm. uh, seeking to destroy the Tutsis in whole and, and, in, and in part. And then the other side, mm -hmm. there were the rebels. Yes. Uh, and the idea that there could be mm. a genocide. You've brought up the, the point of, did this happen after? It happened after you know, did this happen, could this have possibly happened during, uh, after uh, liberation, Correct. after July? Correct. Uh, you say that would have not been possible. Uh, or you say there, were, there was no evidence of that. No, there's no evidence of a coordinated, yes. I mean, there were attacks. I mean, yes. people were killed and yes. in refugee camps. So, but then could there have been, could the RPA, the RPF at the time, as a rebel movement, been guilty, have been found guilty, would they have had the, the means no. to commit genocide? No, they couldn't. They were, you see, it, it wasn't humanly possible, and I'll tell you why. They were too busy trying to contain 
um, uh, contain is perhaps not the word I'm trying to use. They're too, too busy trying to gain ground to be able to secure, you know? So they are approaching and they're trying to secure the country and take over the country and um, protect or secure the country as best they could. And everything else that was going on in Kigali. It wasn't humanly possible um, for them to have the spread to be chasing refugees and doing what they are alleged to have done. Not on a concerted national planning level, as we saw with the genocide. You see, widespread and systematic attacks in international criminal law require coordination. It, inquire, it requires um, coordination, not only on a local level, but on a central level. And when people talk about a double genocide, if you know the amount of planning that went into the genocide against the Tutsi, the purchase of machetes, how machetes were imported, how refugees were gathered in pre preconceived safe locations, how political leaders were earmarked for tag and targeted and eliminated right here in, in Kigali and in other parts of the country. There was no such evidence uh. against the RPF. Uh. I'm not saying there were no killings, right? Uh. But there, were no such, there was no such evidence of a plan against the truth. Uh. There were, guys were too busy trying to hold on to territory and um, run a country uh. that they just liberated. Yeah. Um, that, of course, does not um, forestall renegade soldiers, all right? There's no one who sit here and say there were no uh. bunch, uh, groups of renegade soldiers who just took law into their own hands and went into some village and, yeah, of course. And efforts, obviously, were made by the military to make such people account for their crimes within their own military um, um, system. But and you know that to be true? As in which part of it? Were they, they, you said that the efforts were made by the military to yeah, there were, there were some. There, yes, there were, some, there were some cases of court martials taking place. Mm. I, I, yes, I mean, as part of my work, I, mm. I, I was privy to some of that. Okay. I was privy to some of that. Um, I was privy to some of that. I was privy to some of the investigations that we did, that we also shared um, with the government, and I was privy to some prosecution that took place, yes. Mm. So, you're talking about your experience as, as, as an investigator. And, uh, a pro and, and a prosecutor. But then in 2001, you were then named lead prosecutor um, in yes. the, uh, the trial of the masterminds of the genocide uh, in Bicesero, Kibuya and Bicesera. Yes, um, I, I had, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. So mm -hmm. I had joined the tribunal in 1978, in 1998, sorry, mm -hmm. and spent a year um, as a legal advisor, advising on the drafting of indictments and supervising witness statements. At the time, we had only three accused persons in custody, or maybe four. Um, we had Kaishima, we had... Obed Ruzindana, we had Ruth Ganda, and we had Gerard in Takiturumana. Aki Yusu came in at some later stage. And we had Aki Yusu, yes, so five, five or six. When I came in, I was dealing with Kibuye. There were two defendants in Kibuye already on trial. They were all joined in one indictment, but Kaishima and Ruzindana were severed. Shortly afterwards, um, Alfred Musema, who had been arrested in Switzerland even before the tribunal was created, yeah. was now handed over to the tribunal by the Swiss government. Musema had been arrested in Switzerland in 1994, just after the genocide, yeah. even before the tribunal was created. 
And the Swiss had carried out his investigation, the investigation against him, and were intending to prosecute him. But of course, once the tribunal was established, the tribunal then had primacy over the crime of genocide in Rwanda. And all the states that had genocide suspects had to turn over their suspects. Mm. So suddenly, the Swiss government transferred Alfred Musema to the tribunal. We were so short of staff that there were no prosecutors to prosecute Musema. Mm. I had just come in from London. I didn't have much prosecutorial experience, but I was a defense lawyer. And very quickly, um, we had to put a team together because my arrival at the tribunal in 1998 also corresponded with the time where the ICTR was under a lot of criticism mm. for being so slow uh, with its work. In fact, in 1978, there were no new trials. 1978, right? No, sorry, 19, I keep saying 1978, 1998. Mm. So the first trial started in 1997. And in 1998, there were no new trials. I came in in January 98. So there was pressure on the prosecutor to put forward a new trial. Also, Alfred Musema was transferred in 1998. And we committed ourselves to start his trial in, at the beginning of 1999. And that was how I was transferred from Kigali to Rwanda. To Arusha. To, to, to Arusha, to start the Alfred Musema trial. Um, I was joined by Holo Makwaya, who had just been prosecuting Obed Rosindana and Kaishima, and a, a Ugandan senior trial attorney called Jane Adong from Uganda, who had never done criminal law in her life. She was an environmental lawyer, and she was leading the team. But because she was new on the job and didn't have much experience of criminal law, it fell to Holo and I to really hold the fort. And that's how come I ended up in 1998, or 1999, early 99, as a trial attorney on the Musema case. So I did Musema, the fastest ever trial in ICTR, six months. After Musema, I did Baglishima. Um, and after Baglishima, then there was a reshuffle within the leadership of the Office of the Prosecutor. Madame Adong um, was asked to leave the tribunal. I then was asked to step up in her place yeah. as a very young 34-year-old lawyer um, to lead this landmark case against Pastor Elisa Fanin Takiturmana and his son, Dr. Yeah. Gerard. And that was in September 2001. When I think about the, the ICTR in Arusha, yes. you know, it's the, the judges in their mm -hmm. scarlet robes. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a lot of... Uh, pomp. Pomp. And, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of pomp. And, and when you read about it as well, mm -hmm. there were things that, you know, did not make sense mm -hmm. for people just reading about the tribunal and, mm -hmm. and the goings on and, you know, uh, how the, the witnesses were treated and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. I'd, mm -hmm. like to, I'd like you to, as someone who was actually there, mm -hmm. to kind of take us back to that time and... and and w your experience, your overall experience of uh, being a prosecutor in, in, in that court system, as well as some of the things that you saw, some of the challenges that you saw, uh, your treatment from judges, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, uh, defendants were you know, going about business, I'd like uh, you to kind of take us back to that time. There are many aspects to it. And if we divide it into segments, um, the evolution within the prosecution, the evolution within the trial chambers, 
the evolution within the registrar which provided the support um, for the work that we did. So the tribunal had three organs and each organ suffered different challenges. Some of those challenges were interrelated, some of those challenges overlapped, but they were challenges and they impacted on the entire work. So, the very first and basic challenge was whether or not there was enough or adequate, no, let me say enough, whether the infrastructure was adequate to, to facilitate the work. Bear in mind that the ICTR at the time was not working from a purposely designed structure like the special court for Sierra Leone had in Freetown. Yeah. We didn't have our own specially designed building. We were renting space at the International Conference Center in Arusha. Office space, which had to be adapted for our work. So what used to be office space was turned into courtroom one courtroom at a time. But the infrastructural needs, our infrastructural needs as an institution did not progress as fast as our needs, our procedural needs, mm. if you see what I mean. So maybe there were two cases on at the time, but there was only one courtroom. So what happened? they had to alternate, the, ch the, the judges had to, the panels yeah. had to alternate the use of the courtroom. Yeah. Along the way, a second courtroom became available. So there was more avenue to hear the cases. By the time I was bringing Musema up, there had been three trials going on, Obed Rosindana and Kaishima, Akayesu and Rutaganda. There were only two courtrooms at the time. And there were panels of judges. There were, I think there were only six judges to start with. Huh. And later, by the time I started uh, with um, Baglishima, they'd become nine. So for the first three, four years, there were only six. And they had to sit in two panels. We had only one courtroom. So they had to share the courtroom. So even though as an office, we were perhaps procedurally ready to supply the chambers with the cases or the trials, the infrastructure was not there to cope. And even though there was so much criticism about the delay in the trials, the truth of the matter was that the infrastructure was really not present. And people forget that it's not enough just to hire prosecutors or to hire investigators or to hire judges. We in the transcripts and watching the videos of what had transpired. So, as, as we grew as an institution, as we grew as an institution, the process grew with us. At some stage in their wisdom, the General Assembly thought, let's give them more judges. So we grew from six judges to nine judges to 12 judges and at some stage, we had 21 judges. They were called ad litem judges, part-time judges, not full-time. Guess what? When we had 21 judges... Did you get more courtrooms? We forgot that <laughs> judges need courtrooms to sit in. So, for a while, the judges had no courtrooms to sit in. They were sitting in their offices. Because... The political leaders were making decisions in New York. The infrastructure in Arusha was not 
evolving as fast as the political decisions were being made. And one problem or challenge impacted on another section. And going back to the original question you asked, so in moving from my initial trial of Musema, which actually still has the record of the fastest and most efficiently run trial, no fault of mine, um, but because of the defense. Um, the Musema's defense team were extremely professional, but they were experienced. There was a man called Stephen K. QC, uh, at the time QC, it's now called KC. He's a British lawyer who teamed up with Professor Mikhail Waldimirov, and together they represented Alfred Musema. But what was unique about them was that that same team had conducted the very first trial at the ICTY a year before, or two years before. That's the Tadic. International, international yeah. Criminal, criminal Tribunal for, for the Yugoslavia. former Yugoslavia. Yeah. So they had done the Tadic case at the ICTY, which was the very first war crimes case at the ICTY. So they had some experience um, of international criminal justice. By the time they arrived in Arusha and Musema was transferred from Switzerland, they hit the ground running. Because of the length of time it had taken to prosecute Rutuganda, Akayusu, and Kaishima, because everything was an issue for the defense, for the prosecution. We had to prove everything, even the occurrence of a genocide, the existence of a genocide. Tutsis were targeted. Everything was, was an issue. In the OTP, we then... De That's the Office of the, Office of the Prosecutor. We then developed something we called a request to admit facts. It's a document where we break down the indictment and we have little boxes and we send it to the defense and say, there was genocide in Rwanda. Do you admit it? Do you deny it? Or are you neutral? Charles Adeogu is from Nigeria. Do you admit it? Do you deny it? Or are you neutral? So we had this huge document, which we would often send off to defense counsel. The whole point was to try and narrow the issues in contention so that we as prosecutors will be able to broaden or narrow the scope of our case. We know what we have to prove. What is Sani challenging? Is Sani challenging the fact that Charles is a boy? Yeah. If that is not in contention, then I don't have to prove that I'm a boy, right? Yeah. So we move on to other things. So that was the whole idea. Let's narrow the issues. Most defense counsel at the time will send that form back with Deny, 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 they just denied everything. So everything was still an issue. Until the Alfred Musema defense team. I sent the request to admit facts out. I got it back maybe a month later. Admit, 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 admitted, 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 admitted. The Musema team admitted all the basic facts and narrowed the issue down to whether or not Alfred Musema was involved in the attacks mm. finish. They were not interested in denying whether genocide occurred. Mm. They were not interested in denying whether the attacks were widespread and systematic. They were not in interested in denying what was obvious. Yes. They just narrowed it down to, was Musema there as charged in the indictment? Did he do the things you say he did? No, we deny. So very quickly, we were able to narrow the issues down. And we didn't need to be calling experts to prove the existence of a genocide. We didn't need to bring experts to show that the killings were happening all over Rwanda. Mm. We just focused on the issues concerning Musema's culpability as an accused person. What the practical effect of that was that we were able to narrow down that trial and just go through it from start to finish in six months. Then came the Baglishima trial. And Baglishima, as you know, was the very first acquittal at the ICTR, mm. which didn't go down well with the Rwandan government. There were reasons for that. I was an intricate part of that team. Um, the problem we had with Baglishima was that the investigators were not well versed in 
the Rwandan geographical makeup. Can you remind us who he was? Ignis Batlishima was the bookmaster of Mabanza commune mm. in Kibuye prefecture. Okay. And he had been charged with genocide. But the problem in the case was, as part of the investigation in the early days, there were some hills in Karongi that our investigators had mistaken. They all had the same name. So you could have two or three Karongi hills. Mm -hmm. You could have two or three Muira hills. Um, and we, the investigators mistook them for each other. The defense knew that we had mistaken those hills for each other, and they kept quiet. At the end of the trial, they filed a motion for the court to move to Rwanda. Hmm. They wanted the court to actually take notice of the massacre site. When we came to Rwanda, it's the first time it ever been ordered at the ICT. It's under the rules. You can apply for the court to come to the crime scene. We all came to Rwanda. And the judges turned to us as prosecutors and said, oh yes, take us to where you allege this massacre took place. Mm. And we took them there. And we didn't know we were taking them to the wrong hill. Mm. We had gotten it totally wrong. Not our fault, our investigators. Why did this happen? In the initial stages of the tribunal, we were very suspicious of locals. So Rwandans had very limited, very limited um, interaction. interaction in our work, mm. for obvious reasons. You did not. You thought that we're either we biased. We, for we one don't know who to believe. Other. Yes. We didn't know who to believe. We didn't know who to know. No, no, not that we didn't know who to believe. We didn't know who to trust. Mm. I heard the lady the other day, a lady, the head of Gachacha, um, speaking, and she was telling us the other day how. When the Gachacha system of justice started, they had recruited some judges. It turned out the judges had been perpetrators in the genocide. We had a similar problem. We didn't know who to trust. So there was, a, there was an unspoken policy not to involve Rwandans. The locals. In the locals. As well as the government. Yes. And we paid. It cost us. We paid dearly for it. It's one of the lessons we've learned from international criminal justice. We paid dearly for it. So the man, so, so take us to that time. So basically, we had alleged the wrong massacre site once uh, or twice. And so when, once that happened, no. the judge benefits. Well, of course, I mean, I mean we're, not able, the, we're not able to the, prove beyond the reasonable doubt that, I, he that, is, that he... If, we, if we're not even sure of our own massacre site. Yes. All right? So that was a very painful lesson. Mm. Rwandans, of course, just knew that Baglishima was acquitted. Nobody knew why. Again, another huge challenge in the work that we did. Not having any precedent. Not having any um, knowledge geographically or historically of what is what. How this is this. And we just, just got it wrong. But it, it's allowed. So by the time I got to Intakitu Romana, which was now the first time that I, as a young 33, 34 year old lawyer, prosecutor, was having to head my own team and direct my own prosecution, um, I, had, I had been thrown into the deep end. I had some experience. I had been bruised, and I had survived the bruise, and I thought I was a lot more comfortable. And I was. Um, I had the support of a phenomenal team. By now, I had been joined by Wallace Kapaya, who was a t very um, seasoned Tanzanian prosecutor. We had Boitia Stevens, who was a Sierra Leonean American. Florida Kabasinga had come and joined us as an intern from Makerere University. And we were dealing with yet another experienced defense counsel, a man called Ramsey Clark, who used to be the Attorney General of the United States. Mm -hmm. So this is little me, a 34-year-old prosecutor, having to confront such a robust figure as Ramsey Clark. Um, 
as they say, the rest is history. We did actually succeed in convicting both Pastor Ntaketu Romana and his uh, son, Dr. Gerard, yeah. um, after about a year of, 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 of trying that. But that was very, very challenging. Yeah, yes. I can. So right now, when if you're to ask, not young Rwandans, because most of them were not present, uh, present but <clears throat> some of the older generation will tell you, Meh. ICTR was, was a waste of money. Oof. For the amount of money, uh, billions of dollars, that was spent to prosecute, to be honest, a handful uh, of, 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 uh, of, um, of um, suspects. Perpetrators, yeah. Perpetrators. It would seem that, you know, the amount of resources that was put in versus the final, uh, the final the outcome. output is not, it's not equal. Yeah. Uh, would you, do you actually believe that fundamentally the Arusha-based court lived up to its own stated purposes? Yes, I do. Mm. Um, like I said at the beginning of this conversation, there was no precedent to the work that we did. The Genocide Convention of 1948 only existed on paper. So if nothing else, the Rwanda Tribunal succeeded in irreversibly changing the landscape of what today is known as international criminal law. In fact, international criminal law prior to the Rwanda Tribunal only existed on paper. It's the jurisprudence that emerged from the work that we did at the Rwanda Tribunal and the former Yugoslavia at the time. That jurisprudence is what today forms the basis of what everybody walks around the world claiming as international criminal law. Mm. The jurisprudence of the crimes of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes, and also the criminal responsibility of defendants, either as individual perpetrators or superior responsibility. All that jurisprudence came out of the cases that we did in Rwanda. That is what students of international criminal law are studying, that's what authors of international criminal law are writing about. That is what practitioners or myself can sit back and say, I contributed to the development of international criminal law because I was part of 12 trials or 13 trials and all that. So we, know we not only built the jurisprudence, which is the law, through the case law, because the crimes against humanity Crimes against humanity is not codified in any convention. It's mm. case, it's man-made, it's made by cases. So the jurisprudence evolved through the cases. Genocide, which is codified in the convention, only existed in writing until, the, until Akayesu. Crimes against humanity, well, the Geneva Convention existed, but again, um, was expanded through the work. So we developed the jurisprudence, but we also developed the practice. This whole practice of prosecuting international crimes was developed through the work we did at the ICTR. The model of international justice, prosecution, chambers, the registry, witness protection, all the things I've told you about, the rules, the amendments, um, was all developed through the practice. Now, why is that important? It's important because even though there were unique experiments in and of themselves that cost a lot of money, they formed the basis of the future of international criminal law. As you can see, from the fact that there is now a permanent international criminal court at The Hague.
as you can see from the fact that there have been several hybrid international tribunals, Sierra Leone, East Timor, um, Cambodia. Yeah. There have been several models that the world can now choose from. Had it not been for the work of the Rwanda Tribunal, there would have been no models to choose from. There would have been no expertise. I started this work 26 years ago. I'm 58 years old. I was only 32 when I started this work. So there's now, Florida was my intern. So there's now a crop of seasoned international prosecutors, seasoned international lawyers who have 25, 20 years, 19 years worth of experience, which did not exist in 1998. Mm. Dr. Charles, I have one last question before, mm -hmm. I, before this ends. I, I like to ask about what's happening in the world today. Mm. When you look at what's happening, you have instances of, <clears throat> of genocide happening in Eastern DRC, where, <clears throat> where uh, Tutsi rondophones are being targeted. You have what's also happening in Gaza and the Middle East. There's a lot of things that are happening that, you know, kind of make us wonder whether that idea of never again is actually <coughs> ever going to be. That, that slogan, never again to genocide, never again to genocide. So bearing in mind what's happening in the world, hmm. what role do you think or does international justice, justice actually have any role in the world today to prevent conflict and prevent genocide as well? Well, international law cannot prevent it. It can only deter it. Um, at least that is the, that is the, um, the model that most of the world has signed up for. Something that can act as a deterrent factor to widespread violations of international criminal law. You have raised um, some very significant examples um, which might be indicative of the hypocrisy of the real world um, as regards the response of the international community to certain violations. And examples are abound. Um, some of the things you've alluded to is one of the difficulties that African countries have with the International Criminal Court and the perception of the ICC and international criminal justice as a whole as being targeted at a certain part of the world. Whether or not those criticisms are justified is the subject of another interview. Having said that, with the benefit of hindsight, having been at the very forefront of the creation of accountability institutions to address widespread international violations, I am of the view that there are lessons learned and that perhaps the most appropriate or most efficient model of international justice has to be contained in what I would describe as a hybrid model of international justice. Hybrid in the sense that the victim state, the, situation, the state in which the situation occurred, has greater control over the establishment and the design of the accountability mechanism. And I say this because I personally believe that not only does, gen does justice have to be done, but justice has to be seen to be done. And that is important 
because the ability of victims of widespread human rights violation to follow the accountability proceedings aids their reconciliation, as you would yourself have deciphered from your own locally designed justice system called Gachacha. What is important about the Gachacha? The perpetrators are confronted by their own victims and survivors. And the victims are able to follow the confessional statements and the remorse or lack thereof. And that has to have, and that has to aid the process of healing. I don't want to use the word forgiveness because who am I to judge and decide who should forgive who? That's an individual matter. But in terms of reconciling a community and healing, I think it's so important for victims and survivors of widespread attacks, violations of international law, to be able to follow the accountability process. And that's one major regret that I have about the work I did in Rwanda. The inability of the many witnesses who supported my work to follow the outcome, the progress, um, was for me really um, a major drawback. And because of that, I am in favor of accountability systems and mechanisms that carry the state where the crimes took place along. We've seen that in Sierra Leone. We've seen that in Cambodia and some other. Why is this important? On a practical level, it's important to involve the locals right from the beginning. Mm. On a practical level, it's important to build local capacity. Whether amongst judges, amongst prosecutors, amongst witness protection officials, amongst drivers, amongst psychologists, amongst medical personnel who help with the um, trauma. Yeah. So you, you, you end up building a crop of your own local personnel that will remain in your jurisdiction. And that experience can be transferred all around the judicial system. Maybe not prosecuting genocide, because hopefully it will never occur again. But that skill is readily applicable to other things. And I think that process is cheaper. Whatever the infrastructure that is set up remains in your country. The jurisprudence and the documentation is owned by you. Mm. Your countrymen are trained and have the knowledge within them, not a Nigerian like me, coming to tell you about what we did in your country. Not a Briton coming to lecture you about what we did. It will be your own people who will be standing in Butari or in Yarugenge saying, we did this in Gisovo. We did this in... Obviously, for the benefit, it's for the benefit of the wider Rwandan populace that have the benefit of what you are doing to be able to interview or come across someone like myself who has the institutional knowledge, interview him and then share that knowledge to say, actually, well, you know what, this is what happened. Mm. They could have been experiencing it real time. 
had that tribunal been here. Yes. Real time. They could have been able to walk into the public gallery on a normal day, sitting down in the public gallery and watching me do what I did. Watching Florida do what Florida did. Watching the witnesses testify. Watching the judges listen to the testimony. Rather than have to wait 14 years after the fact mm. for an interview such as this. Yeah. I think it's sad that atrocities continue to occur around the world. Um, I think there has to be a greater effort of the developing countries to hold certain countries to account in respect to violations. Um, and there has to be a firmer grip on establishing mechanisms that would deter leaders and countries from widespread violations of international criminal law. My heart goes out to the people of Gaza um, because really, I mean, um, there couldn't be a greater example. I mean, every time I watch that situation, it reminds me of the work we did here. Um, there couldn't be a more practical example of a people being targeted based on their ethnicity. And as far as I'm concerned, the evidence suggests attempts to actually just wipe them out yeah. as a people. Yeah. And that cannot be right. It's not right at all? It's not right. And it's even worse that the international community sit down and do nothing. Because Dr. Charles, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank it you. Was, and it was good an luck. Absolute, absolute pleasure. Good luck with your work. Really, it's very important for the reasons that I've said. Your work is so important um, to let people know what, what actually happened out there. So thank you. Thank you as well. If you enjoyed the conversation today, share your thoughts with us on our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok.